perspective series uh, of the fall semester. Um, so glad that you guys are here. First in-person um, lecture offer. <laughs> um, but we are so glad that we are able to do this, and I'd like to thank uh, Drew for to, um, <clears throat> for volunteering um, to give this presentation. Um, glad, welcome back. And um, basically, I, I think we all know Drew, but I'd just like to <clears throat> mention a few things. Uh, Dr. Costa received his PhD from SUNY Albany. He's a professor of philosophy and currently chair of the social science division at SUNY Adirondack. <coughs> he has been teaching here since 2003, and his current areas of research include ancient and contemporary metaphysics, epistemology, social contract theory, logic, and philosophy of religion. Um, <coughs> so today's presentation is philosophy after Darwin, and. Um, so, uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, everyone, for, uh, for coming today. Um, when I first was thinking about this uh, presentation, I was uh, reading a book by um, a philosopher by the name of Daniel Dent, who wrote a book called Darwin's Dangerous Idea. And um, one of the things very much as well as, has anyone ever heard of the term universal acid before? <laughs> universal acid is a, it's a fictitious substance, but it's apparently a substance that, uh, it's a thought experiment. You know, if you have this substance, uh, it can eat through anything. And so, once you apply it, say, put on this chair, you just dissolve it. And it raises all these interesting questions about, well, wouldn't, how would you contain the universal substance? If it dropped on the earth, would it eventually and these types of questions. He compared Darwin's theory of evolution to universal acid. And what Dennett did in his book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, is he takes the theory and he extends it into several other areas of inquiry, in particular cosmology, geology, other areas of the sciences as well. And he demonstrates that it has application not just to biology, but to several areas of human inquiry. And so it got me thinking about its effects on philosophy, which Dennett himself um, uh, is, is, is a philosopher as well, and how it has radically affected philosophy in the 20th century. Now, to explain this, we need to look a little bit at, well, the history of philosophy prior to Darwin, and um, the view that Darwin's theory challenges. Now, before I go on, origin of species. Darwin himself was hesitant to apply the conclusions he reached in origin to human beings, in particular our minds and our intellect. Um, he had, in origin, a, a, a relatively well, it was broad in scope, but it was focused in the sense that he was concerned with the question of how it is that we get speciation, how it is that we get different species in the world. And um, remarkably, the book Origin of Species does pretty much everything but give a good explanation of how species originate. It's in fact some have said, and I forget the name of the particular author, said that he would actually be in trouble if he published that today under false advertising because he doesn't really give a good explanation of how species arise. But what Darwin does do, and this is his, this is the idea that has revolutionized our thinking about the world and what some consider to be one of the most ingenious ideas, he has introduced the process of natural selection. Darwin himself did not invent the idea of evolution. The idea that nature, at least in principle, 
could organize itself actually stretches back into antiquity. The earliest records that I know of when we have this are around the Epicurus, around the uh, third or second, third and fourth century BCE. The idea that you could have matter organizing itself into complex forms that we have today had been considered, but it had never been taken seriously. Darwin's idea, and what revolutionized our thinking, was he actually found a mechanism, a relative, not at all an obvious, but a relatively simple mechanism through which you could get complexity from an otherwise chaotic world. And this has turned out to be one of the most well-confirmed theories To start, and to understand the sense in which Darwin's idea of natural selection, which we'll talk about in a moment, was so revolutionary, we have to go back to the ancient Greeks, of course. Now, when we think of ancient, the ancient Greeks, one of the first I think, um, things that comes to mind is their, what we now call anthropomorphism, early Greek tribal religious belief postulated, as with many tribal religious beliefs, not just in the Western, but in the Eastern world, many, many different gods. And these gods were used as explanations of natural phenomena. And, um, and so, Greek tribal systems, very much as, we, as well as tribal systems we see in other areas, like Asia and Africa, had polytheistic systems in which they in which they postulated the existence of deities that had human-like characteristics. Now, the reason for this anthropomorphism is relatively simple. There is something that they were familiar with. That was the operations of their own mind. We're all familiar with the operations of our own mind. And so, what, and so they were also aware that when they made a decision, it would might result in their movement, and that um, and they were aware of the fact that their own mental activity caused changes in the world around them. So what originally had the earliest ideas of anthropomorphism, of explaining nature in terms of a human mind, as opposed to a blind, but by no means random process of something like natural selection, this can be traced back to these earliest beliefs. But although anthropomorphic tribal belief tribal religious belief is in many ways very ubiquitous uh, among cultures. Something very interesting began to happen in Greece in particular, from which we now get what we call our scientific method. <clears throat> Around 650 AD, <clears throat> the first philosopher we know of in the ancient world by the name of Thales He made a prediction about a solar eclipse. And he made a prediction that with some degree of accuracy um, <clears throat> came true. And what he had done is he had looked at various historical records and he had noted that these occurred with regularity. And the regularity with which these things occur gave Thales an insight. And the insight was that Although the natural world, as it appears to us, may seem chaotic, it may seem that there, it's full of randomness, and it may seem that it's full of pain and terror and things along those lines, perhaps one of the reasons we postulated uh, gods with human-like qualities as responsible for it, he also noted that there was a regularity to nature. And this regularity could be seen not just in solar eclipses, but in things like the movement of the tides, the sun rising at a st uh, uh, roughly the same place and at the same time in the morning, the change of the seasons, water freezing at particular temperatures. He noted that the universe, the cosmos, seemed to be, have principles of organization and regulation that could be rational. We consider Thales the first philosopher because 
Thales was the first that we know of who gave an explanation of reality, its fundamental characteristics, which we won't go into here, what he thought, um, <clears throat> in terms of its ultimate principles, without directly appealing to religious explanation. Philosophers after, or thinkers after Thales, proceeded in a similar way. And they developed the theories in uh, uh, the theories that Thales advanced, in, uh, and they increased in complexity. Thales himself, he held that the universe ultimately was composed of water. Now, the reason he held this was for certain uh, was water is capable of transforming solid liquid and gas. It also is something that seems to embody the very chaotic nature of the universe itself, that it seemed to be in a constant state of change. So the very essence of water seemed to be that it was constantly moving to take on any shape, and he saw this reflected in reality. And so he postulated water as the ultimate principle from which everything else was derived. Now, um, other philosophers came along, and like all the um, students and thinkers, they disagreed. And from this, we got other basic elements like earth, air, fire, and water, etc. And this idea of a rational system that regulated the universe, or, or at least that the universe could be rationally understood, began to uh, uh, began to take shape. Now. <clears throat> What accompanied this, and this is in particular, this probably has to do with the with the religious views at the time, is because the universe seemed to be capable of being grasped by the human mind. The idea that the author or the creator of the universe was human, uh, possessed a mind like ours, followed quite naturally from this. And so, in the broadest of rushstrokes. What happened was, from Thales, through Socrates, through Plato, through Aristotle, through the medieval period, what we get is this view that the universe, the chaotic, a chaotic universe, an otherwise chaotic universe, is ordered by a mind. It's a mind-first picture of reality. And again, this is anthropomorphism, perhaps at its most obvious. This is the attribution of human-like qualities, in this case our intellect, to matter itself. And so the picture that emerged, oh, emerged, and you don't know how excited I am to be using the chalkboard again. Right? This is, yeah, I, and I actually had to go on a chalk hunt this morning, uh, a few minutes ago, and anyways, I'm very excited to be using the chalk again. After COVID, the Luddite in me is coming out. view of the world. Georgia, how do I turn this? Yeah, I'm sorry, the other one. Thank you. Oh, oh, well, yeah, upside down. Just used to crack the You just turn the document down. There we go. All right, go cool. on. That'll work. So, basically, it works like this. <clears throat> so, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, what you have, let's say, at metaphysical rock bottom, is you have chaos. And for the and so the chaos that existed here was often considered by the ancient Greeks the term that they often at least when you translate it from the Greek was flux, which means change over time. Now this chaos is a lack of order, and it's often it's often represented religiously by water. Um, it's, uh, as a matter of fact, if you read Genesis chapter one verse one, it talks about God's face being on the waters before God created the earth and stages. Now, of course, the universe is not entirely chaotic. What then happens is you get, from chaos, is you get order. All right? Now, order, in this particular case, what it means, so from chaos, you can derive, this gets derived. Order can be seen again 
in the regular rotation of the planets, the, sun, the rising and setting of the sun, um, <coughs> uh, 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 the tides coming in and out, etc. And ultimately, the author of all of this is mind. Okay? So this mind first picture of reality can be understood as is you have mind. And what it does is it acts upon the chaos, which then produces the order that we see in the natural world. But the order cannot produce itself. The view that emerged from this is you cannot get orderliness simply from chaos. You have to have some kind of active agent that is, uh, that is causing this to occur. So the mind is necessary in order for there to be the regularity that exists in nature. Now, the ancient Greek term for this is logos, which is what we get the term logic from today. The original definition of logos meant a uh, cosmic principle. And this was, I'm not sure if it was introduced by, but it certainly was made famous by the brilliant philosopher Heraclitus, who died around 480 um, um, uh, before the Common Era. And, um, and Logos was a cosmic principle that essentially defined and gave, and gave being to and order to and regularity to all of nature. So Logos is a unifying cosmic principle Their, what they considered to be matter was not what we might consider to be matter today. 
They included minds and souls and spirits as material things, often very subtle things like an ether or something along those lines. Now, um, but Plato, what he is perhaps most famous for, and this, and this still echoes today, is he rejected materialism. Plato said there is matter, there is a material world. He called this the sensible world. But there's also an ideal world. There is an immaterial world that is populated by objects of knowledge. And these, some of you probably heard of this, are called forms. And Plato was absolutely convinced that there had to be these things called forms. And everything had a form. So for example, this here is a chair, that's a chair, these are all chairs. And in order for them to be chairs, there had to be an absolutely perfect form of chair through which these things derive their being. These things in this world are imperfect copies of what chairs are. And so, and the reason they're imperfect is because, well, if you look at this one, it's got a little bit of rust on it, etc. That's lacking in perfection. So there's this ideal form of a chair. Now these ideal forms, they are immaterial, but they're not chaotic. They're permanent, they're stable, they're unchanging. And they're also immaterial. They don't take up any space. But perhaps what was most interesting about Plato's system is this. For Plato, there was a unifying principle that bound all the other forms together in this immaterial, perfect world. And this was what he called the form of the good. Now, this has caused lots of confusion. What did, wait on, what did he tell this student? What does he mean by this? Well, what he means by this is that all things have a function. And if they perform their function well, that's when we say they are good. So to give you an example that I often use in class, if I were to draw these figures, well, they're all kind of pathetic. And if I were to ask you which is the best circle, they're all circles, we probably would say this one here. And the reason is because this is the one that most closely approximates, it's not perfect, but closely approximates the perfect form of circle. So this is a good circle in the sense that it most closely approximates the form, whereas, you know, this is a particularly bad one. But the point is, is that notice that when you say something is good, it's a value judgment. And it invokes something called teleology. It invokes purpose. It, in, it invokes function. This top-down approach to reality and a demiurge or a god responsible for it that gives being to all of the order in the world <clears throat> ultimately had human-like ideas and goals in mind. And this was teleology. So Plato forcefully introduces into the metaphysical picture of the universe, and this is a view that has had enormous, in, has had enormous influence, the idea that everything in the universe, all things, from chairs to, ta uh, to tables, um, you know, uh, cabbages and kings, all have a function or a purpose, or to use the Greek word, a telos. And this is teleology. Aristotle, although highly critical of Plato in many ways, in particular, this Aristotle was very critical of the idea of the forms, also postulated that in order for there to be regularity in nature, in order to account for the stability that was observed, the fact that there were different things that could be categorized in rational ways, there also had to be a mind responsible for it. And I'll talk about, well, 
And Aristotle famously gives, in, for explanation, gives what we now call the four causes. Now, Aristotle's causes are essentially, and it's, it's a bit clumsy to do this, but they're basically, whenever you're going to ask a who, a what, a when, a where, a why question, that's essentially what Aristotle was trying to do with the four causes. Now, they're not causes in the traditional sense that we use the word cause today, but there were four. There was what's called the material cause. The material cause is the matter that something is made out of. So, you know, this chair is made out of vinyl and metal, et cetera. That would be the material cause of why it exists. There's the formal cause. The formal cause of something is essentially the blueprint or the schematic that, again, not literally, but figuratively, a blueprint or schematic that it follows. It's the way that the matter is organized into a shape that can be rationally understood. That's Aristotle's substitute for a form, by the way. There's also the efficient cause. The efficient cause is, is the, the event or events that are directly responsible for bringing this thing into existence. I suppose in this case it would be you know, the assembly line production uh, process. That would be the efficient cause. In the case of water freezing, it would be the temperature dropping. That's the, that's the sense of cause we tend to use today most of the time. And last, and by no means least, and arguably of most importance, there was for Aristotle the final cause. The final cause was the thing's function or purpose as well. Aristotle, philosophizing under the influence of Plato, for which you can't get a ticket, um, <coughs> also introduces the idea of teleology. So both Plato and Aristotle, although they had fundamental metaphysical disagreements about all sorts of things, they, like the earliest philosophers, not only accepted that everything in nature had a telos, or could be understood teleologically, but they also held that mind was necessary for the production of order in the world. In their metaphysical and systems, their systems of science, Aristotle's in particular, would not essentially would make it would not allow for any type of explanation that did not somehow, in some way, invoke mind, directly or indirectly. And this was through teleology. Well Fast forwarding up to the Renaissance. I'd love to talk about the medieval period, but we'll just fast forward up to the Renaissance. Along comes Rene Descartes. Now, Rene Descartes, often considered the father of modern philosophy, and for very good reason. He does, he serves as a bridge between the ancient thinking about the world and the way we think about it today. Rene Descartes, following Plato, divides reality into two different substances. For, for Descartes, there was mind and there was matter. And Descartes famously articulates an idea that had been percolating, I guess we might say, in the ancient world about matter, but never clearly identified. But Descartes does a very good job of explaining it. When Descartes talks about matter, he talks about things that have a general set of properties like shape, mass, volume. Another interesting characteristic of matter by itself is that two pieces of matter can't occupy the same space at the same time. The fancy term for that is a unique spatiotemporal location. So he defines matter. But most importantly, what Descartes does is he discusses matter as being, by itself, completely inert. Matter, on its own, is incapable of initiating any change or movement. Now, <clears throat> what I mean by change or movement is if the lights turn, well, that's not the best example. If, for example, the water freezes, the water doesn't freeze itself. There has to be, in Descartes' view, something external to the water, 
in order for it to freeze. Um, if a rock falls off a cliff, the rock didn't cause itself to fall off the cliff. Something else had to cause it to fall off the cliff. The lights being on, they didn't turn themselves on. There's something external to the lights themselves that turned it on. This is sometimes called contact physics. It's no longer in vogue today for very good reason, but it's still, in some ways, an enormously influential idea. To understand this, imagine the universe like a gigantic billiards table, and there's all these billiard balls moving on it. That's matter. <laughs> the atoms of Democritus, perhaps, or something along those. But anyway, now all the billiard balls are bouncing into each other and hitting and moving in different trajectories, etc. Now, none of these things put themselves into motion. What happened was, is there is something else. One billiard ball is shocked or moved by another, and that's how the universe is operating. It's all this matter in motion, regulated by some laws, and but none of these things are causing themselves to move or change. According to Descartes, and also according to Aristotle, and according to many of the medieval philosophers, the only thing that was capable of moving on its own, initiating a change, was mind. Mind was capable, and the only thing capable, of acting ex nihilo, out of nothing. So mind not only was responsible for the order that arrived that that we derive from chaos. Mind is, in fundamental ways, different from matter. And the primary difference is that mind, unlike matter, mind is capable of initiating its own movement. Mind is capable of acting spontaneously on its own without another force acting upon. of reality that emerged from the Cartesian worldview. And of course, his view was not, I mean, he endorsed a school of thought that I'm sure many of you have heard of called rationalism, which is the idea that um, <clears throat> we have some innate ideas and that reason is important for understanding the universe. But the worldview that emerged from this was an utter separation of mind and, of, and matter. And the universe itself, what it was, all of reality, was, of course, ordered, but a new idea began to emerge as well. It also possessed complexity. So not only was there order, there was also what we now refer to as complexity, and which is sometimes called design. In fact, you might have heard, of the, the, by analogy, the universe was often compared to some of the most sophisticated mechanisms they had at the time, things like timepieces and watches in particular. Incredibly sophisticated, even by today's standard, some of what was, was um, some of these watches uh, and timepieces were so intricate, um, it just ravishes us into, into admiration. But anyways, the universe was considered to be this unbelievably sophisticated Oh, but ultimately material machine. It wasn't just ordered in the sense of regular patterns like the planets moving, etc. It was also complex. The parts of this machine were such that <clears throat> they were they interacted with each other in extraordinarily subtle and sophisticated ways. This was in, in part due to the fact that our science, our methods of looking at the world, were getting so much more sophisticated and the sheer amount of complexity that we observed in the world <coughs> was just staggering. So what began to emerge from this is the following. Where's, I can't find my chart. There's my chart. Right. So 
So you have mind, and of course you have order, but we have an additional component now that, again, the earliest thinkers were aware of, but they didn't articulate the idea. There was also complexity. And again, he still had mind. And in at least the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, and in much of, much of the Western world, this was the God, the omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent God of that, of, the, of that tradition. So you still had mind, you still had God, and this was often considered God, and you had chaos, which produced order, and you could also get complexity. Now, what is complexity? Well, probably the best definition of complexity, at least that I'm aware of, was introduced by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Blind Watchmaker. Complexity can be understood in terms of two uh, characteristics. The first is heterogeneity. Heterogeneity means many parts. So something that is complex has many different types of parts. So for example, my Apple Watch here, this is complex. Many kind of different kinds of parts. This piece of chalk is not. It's homogeneous, all right? Now, the other part of complexity, and this is a carryover from the old days of teleology, is proficiency. Proficiency means it can perform a function that you could specify in advance. What I mean by specify in advance means is if you knew enough, you would be able to figure out what the thing does. So if something is complex, it has many, many different parts, but it also can serve a function or purpose. <clears throat> Examples of complex things in the natural world which began to excite our thinking were, well, things like eyes. The eye is an incredibly complex thing. It's not just order by general laws of you know, thermodynamics or whatever, it also possesses an extraordinary degree of complexity and there are many, many different parts and those parts have to be assembled in such a way that they pr can produce the function of sight. And you can look at an eye and you can assign a function to it. Teleology is still present in this explanation of complexity. The wings of a bird also possess complexity. Many, many different parts, but they're put together, organized, such that they enable flight. Not everything in the natural world is complex, necessarily. Um, um, but uh, anyways. So you had complexity. And up until Darwin, it was generally held that the only rational or reasonable explanation of this complexity was something like God. Up through the middle of the 19th century, it was generally held that, in, in the Judeo-Christian Islamic world, it was generally held that the complexity, the order that exists in the natural world has existed for all time, or since the beginning of time, will exist until the end of time. Species were static, they didn't change. And the only way complexity could in fact arise was through some design of intelligence, and this is what's called the design argument. And again, what this is, is an anthropomorphic, teleological approach to nature. As I said before, the idea of evolution is not something Darwin invented. The idea that you could, at least in principle, get complexity by itself out of chaos had been entertained prior to Origin of Species. Again, it goes back to Epicurus. There's a famous what's called Epicurean Hypothesis. And the Epicurean hypothesis states that all there is is atoms, 
in all of them, um, Epicurus was a famous Stoic, not incidentally. All of there are are atoms, and just general laws of nature. And if you essentially give it enough time, isn't it possible and you, that it could settle on an order on its own? You have to make some assumptions. You have to assume a principle of economy that you know, seek to expend the least amount of energy possible. But isn't it possible to imagine that the universe, if you gave it enough time, could settle on a stable arrangement? Epicurus introduced that idea. No one really believed it. But he did introduce that as a possibility. David Hume, in his dialogues concerning natural religion, revives this in a famous passage, which well, I don't really have time to read or get into. Now, in addition, in the 19th century, there have been other proposals along the same line. Uh, um, as a matter, and when Darwin published *Origin of Species*, it has actually turned out that um, uh, it was, uh, Wallace uh, had also introduced the idea as well. Of course, uh, Wallace uh, um, <clears throat> in completely independent uh, from Darwin. So the idea that matter could organize itself—it wasn't new in Darwin's time. What Darwin did is he found the mechanism that made such an account plausible. That's what natural selection does. That's what natural selection is. It's a mechanism that allows us to essentially do this. You can start, now, notice where I'm saying you start. You start with these two. Actually, you start with four. And from order, you can get complexity. Notice I said you can start with order. Maybe we'll have a chance to return to that. I think we're all probably familiar with how natural selection works. But the basic idea is this. It tells this plausible story about how complexity, about how complexity can, in fact, arise. Basically speaking, you postulate enough time, you, co you postulate billions upon billions of interactions between matter, compounds, and proteins, etc. What can happen, although it ne won't necessarily do so, is that you'll get some organisms, and they're going to have mutations. Some of these mutations are going to produce variations in the species. Some are going to hinder the, or the organism's ability to survive and reproduce. Some are going to have no effect on the organism's ability to survive and reproduce. Some are going to enhance the organism's ability to survive and reproduce. And then what happens is the environment essentially selects against those organisms that aren't well suited for that particular environment. And those that are well suited for that environment, those genetic, uh, uh, their, their, those genotypes and phenotypes carry on. And then mutations continue again. And it goes on and on and on. It's a blind process. It has no end goal. It's not attempting to make us better or smarter or anything along those lines. Now. The idea of natural selection, for probably for most of us, is just an almost effortless idea for us to, to conceive of nowadays. This idea that there is this, in a way, a natural filtering mechanism that, if you give enough time, can produce complexity. But at the time, it was revolutionary. And what it did it is it essentially made the top-down mind first approach to reality unnecessary. We now have an explanation of how you can get complexity without having to postulate the design of intelligence. On the overhead, 
that I had up earlier, there was a quote. And perhaps I'll show this at the end. But David Hume, in his famous, in his work, The Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, which was published in 1777, it was after he died. I can't resist. Posthumously. Uh, all right, but uh, anyways. Um, and the reason he published it after his death is because uh, he would get in quite a bit of trouble. He got in enough trouble as it was uh, during his life. But he has this, it's this scathing attack on arguments for uh, the existence of God. And it focuses on the design art, the idea that you need an intelligent designer to produce the complexity in the natural world. And has some of the most powerful criticisms of this. Hume himself entertains the basic idea of the Epicurean hypothesis mentioned earlier, but Hume says something. And he says, what peculiar privilege has this little agitation of the brain that we call thought, that we must make it the model of the whole universe? Our partiality in our own favor is obvious, that's anthropomorphism sound philosophy ought to guard against so natural a Hume was noting, and Hume's brilliance, his insight, almost a hundred years before the publication of Origins, was noting this anthropomorphic tendency that in some ways is almost inescapable and maybe even necessary for a for uh, import. And in many ways is, an, is anticipating the natural selection processes that Darwin introduces. So in the wake of Darwin, teleology, I wouldn't say it's gone by any means, but it has been reduced. We still, in the sciences, often do use teleological explanations, try to understand things in terms of the functions that they perform. But now they tend to be understood more as strategies to help us explain things, as opposed to indicating some type of function or purpose that is given to it by God or the gods. Another profound effect that natural so Darwin's theory has had on philosophy <clears throat> has been how we now treat metaphysics. Historically, metaphysical questions such as the ultimate nature of matter, the relation of cause and effect, mind and its relationship to the body, our actions free, these are all metaphysical questions. It forced us to redefine how we think about metaphysics. The initial reaction to Darwin's idea was something you probably have, might have heard of. It's called logical positivism. Logical positivism was essentially a wholesale rejection of traditional metaphysical lines of inquiry. The logical positivists held that the only things that were real was that you could, those things that could be observed. Traditional metaphysics was seen as essentially useless. In fact, some of the original positivists, they said that metaphysics of the kind that Descartes did, and that Kant did, and that Plato did, was essentially like poetry, but really bad poetry. And you know, um, so, I mean, that's what metaphysics was considered. All that was real was that all was with that that could be observed. You see, what natural selection did is it was so intuitively shocking because what it because essentially it showed something that we all that were, for centuries was held to be a priori just simply impossible. The idea of complexity arising simply from uh, arising out of chaos was just considered again perhaps necessarily impossible was essentially refuted 
by a relatively simple, although by no means obvious, idea. It started to, get, to get make us think that, oh, maybe all this stuff we've been talking about in metaphysics, maybe it's just useless. Well, like many reactions, this was a bad overreaction, but it, nevertheless, it was interesting. As it turns out, well, there's lots of problems with logical positivism, and metaphysics is still alive and well. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. What also occurred is that we began, and this is, relates to what occurred with the logical positivists, is what's called the linguistic turn in philosophy. Not wishing to go as far as perhaps the logical positivists went in rejecting anything that couldn't be directly observed. Oh. <clears throat> Uh, I'll, if I have time, I'll tell you the logical positives. It's great. But uh, anyway, um, many began to actually look at our language and say that many traditional metaphysical problems could actually be resolved if you simply looked at our language, and that many apparently insol unsolvable philosophical problems were not metaphysical issues with the universe or reality itself, but rather were just conceptual. I mean, to give a relatively trivial example of this, and this is, I think, William James. Let's say you uh, you have a tree, and you and um, and you have a squirrel, and the squirrel is traveling around the tree, and then you have a cat which is traveling around both the um, squirrel and uh, and the tree, and the cat is always staying line with the squirrel. So the question is, does the cat go around the squirrel? Now, I mean, is this a serious metaphysical problem? No. You can dissolve it relatively easily by just seeing what definition of around that you're talking about. So again, that's a trivial example, but nevertheless, many have held that apparently insoluble metaphysical or epistemological problems could be dissolved simply by looking at our language. One of the more serious problems would be something along the lines of whether or not our sense experience, for example, accurately represents reality as it is. That's a question I'm sure many of us have considered, right? And one linguistic approach to this is to say, well, this is really sort of an empty problem. <coughs> To talk about things as they are, independent of perception, is really meaningless. It's not a metaphysical problem or an epistemological problem. It's actually asking the question, are things um, outside of our experience, excuse me, does our subjective experience accurately reflect objective reality is as meaningless a question as something like, what is the square root of lunch? All right? It's just a conceptual confusion. And this had implications for accounts of the mind. Most famously, in Philosophical Behaviorism, introduced by Gilbert Ryle um, in his famous book, The Concept of Mind, in which he essentially says, minds, at least as traditionally conceived as conscious things capable of that, don't exist. Again, I'm not saying this is necessarily for the better of this effect, but what it has to do with is, again, focusing on what is observable, focusing on what is, well, immediately present to us. Darwin's approach, Darwin's metaphysics, or excuse me, Darwin's natural selection also had profound effects on ethics. Prior to Darwin, much ethical inquiry was based on a system of ethics that we now call deontological ethics, but also goes by what's called duty-based ethics, in which we look not so much at the consequences of actions, but we look at the actions themselves. And what we do is we try to determine if they are rational and if they are things that can be universalized and extended to others. 
this was made famous in Immanuel Kant's Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals, in which he postulates this ethical system that has nothing to do with consequences in the world, but instead adhering to abstract principles that can be, well, seen as metaphysically necessary. Kant's system is, and continues to be incidentally, an extremely powerful ethical system. However, in the wake of Darwin, we began to abandon these approaches towards ethics in particular that were looking beyond things that occurred in this world. And instead, we began to focus more on practical consequences. In, um, uh, in another, excuse me, we, we stopped looking for principles that were beyond this world, but instead looked at the consequences in this world. It's probably not a coincidence that John Stuart Mill, a famous work, Utilitarianism, was published in 1861, two years after the publication of Origin. Utilitarian ethics, although Mill did not invent this, but he gave it its most precise formulation among the still adopt today, Utilitarian ethics is what we often call a naturalistic system of ethics. It doesn't look to abstract, universalizable, metaphysical principles. It looks to something remarkably practical. The fact that there's something that all human beings seem to desire, and that is meaning and happiness in their lives. And what, it, what utilitarian ethics does, by the name utility, in something useful, it says that our moral obligations are to produce the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number. And this ethical theory <coughs> can in many ways be seen as the direct some, in, um, result of the, well, empirically based contributions that were made by God. And again, it <coughs> utilitarianism had existed prior to publication of Origin, but it's doubtful it was an accident that Mill published two years after this. Also, what has enjoyed quite a bit of um, <coughs> uh, a revitalization, I guess we might say, in the 20th century is the idea of social contract theory. Social contract theory was, well, actually its origins go back to Plato, um, well, like many things but social contract theory, um, <clears throat> you're probably all familiar with Hobbes' Leviathan, um, but in 1970, um, John Rawls uh, uh, publishes a theory of justice and uh, in which, <clears throat> well, essentially it's a, it's a reintroduction of the idea of the social contract. Now, the reason that there is a connection between uh, natural selection and the ideas of evolution and the more empirically approached uh, um, analyses that we engage in today um, <clears throat> is that social contract theory often talks about the fact that we are social creatures, that we depend upon each other for our survival and our well-being, and that for, uh, for us to be able to survive and, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and thrive, we must accept those cooperative components. Um, well, we, we must recognize that we do better as when we cooperate with each other. Many hold that new, these new approaches to social contract theory, which are emphasizing co uh, cooperation beyond what was done prior to Darwin, um, <clears throat> also relate to natural selection as well. In metaphysics also, by no means is metaphysics dead. In fact, it's alive and well. And in particular, what natural selection has produced, and this is an area of personal interest for me, is in the notion of possibility. You see, historically, the idea of possibility, in, um, there were really only two types. There was what we call logical possibility, which means anything that you can coherently conceive of. And then there was what we often call physical possibility, and that's just what was possible within our known laws. But what Darwin's theory has done is has introduced new notions of possibility and how we treat it. And in particular, 
this is um, one of the ways in which it does this. If you could go back, let's say, I don't know, somewhere around, you know, uh, 500 million years or something along those lines, it would be pretty much impossible to specify in advance what type of species would evolve. You might be able to predict that there would be species evolving, but it's, you know, predicting that squirrels, for example, would come into existence would be virtually impossible, just given the number of possible evolutionary trajectories that could occur. And so, <clears throat> but today, since we know that we have a certain set of species, this affects the types of possibilities, at least in biology, that could occur in the future. So new notions of biological possibility have been introduced that philosophers of biology talk about. Chemical possibility, physical possibility, but astronomical possibility, geological possibility. So all these new notions of possibility have been introduced in the way And again, what's revolutionary about the idea is precisely that we no longer need mind to explain complexity. Now, does this mean there are no gods? I mean, that's, that's a separate question. But it does mean that such things are irrelevant to our So as Hume said, what peculiar privilege does this little agitation of the brain that we call thought, that we make it a model of the entire universe, we no longer do that. And I suppose that's the most promising part of the legacy. I don't know. Anyway, I could go on, but I'll end there for today. <clears throat> Any questions for me? Yes. Catherine. Good to see you, by the way. Nice to see you. Um, I believe I read recently that Darwin himself believed that he was all put into motion by God. So he himself thought that there was a first cause. Am I right in that? Um, you know, I think, the, uh, I honestly don't know. I had not heard that. It wouldn't surprise me uh, if he himself believed that. I, I read a quote, and I, I don't have a reference for it, but I, I just had stumbled upon it in the past month. Thought it would be a great question. I don't know. Yeah, I honestly don't know. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Again, his scope was relatively narrow. He was concerned about speciation, and he wouldn't have applied it in a sense. Um, he certainly did recognize the implications it had for explaining mind and explaining intelligence. He did recognize that you could give purely natural explain naturalistic explanations of that. But um, yeah, as far as uh, that specific, I, I don't know.
on that which exists, mm -hmm. and therefore we look for regularity. Well, uh, someone once explained to me that if you really want to understand what a human being is and a human mind is, um, you can sort of summarize this by saying we are pattern-seeking habit formers. And you know, one of the things that we do tend to look for, and this is a bit more of straying into areas of psychology and cognition, but we do tend to want to find order and regularity in nature. And we will often find it, even when it doesn't exist, um, uh, we will uh, assert that there is order um, uh, when it in fact is not there. Maybe I'm not getting... No, 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 that's... Yeah, yeah. But so, I, it, it does seem to be a habit of mind, of, of, of cognition, that what we want to do is we want to find regularities in nature. And that's, in a way, well, what keeps us from being eaten <laughs> is the fact that we are capable of doing this so well, or at least relative to other species. So yeah, I do think we, um, that that's a pretty good assessment of how human minds work. Yes, Ron? I don't know if you got a chance to look at that George C. Williams book I gave you. Oh, uh, Animal Minds? No, no, that was a different book. Well, I was going to bring up the concept that biologists talk more and more about that. No, I think that that's right. I mean, you know, it's it, it that's a later concept in this kind of That's that that's right, and you know, I mean, the basic idea of natural selection has remained relatively untouched. But one of the most recent, how when I say recent, in the past probably forty to fifty years, has been sort of challenging the idea of of, of <coughs> perfection in evolution, and. Some have even said Darwin would have been better off saying not survival of the fittest, but survival of the satisfactory uh, would, would have been a better slogan um, because <clears throat> it does seem that quite a few of our characteristics or characteristics of evolved organisms are not perfect. In fact, there's a term for it. It's called kluged. And when something is kluged, it's a combination of various different factors that don't necessarily contribute to the perfection but they make it of, of an organism, but they actually make it acceptable. The perfect example of this is what, uh, in, at least in human artifacts, is QWERTY keyboards. You know, keyboards that have Q-U-E-R-T. The reason, what is the intelligent purpose behind this? Well, there really isn't. A, now, nowadays, there's not. The reason that, that there's QWERTY still have Q-U-E-R-T-Y, is because <coughs> original typewriters were designed such that <laughs> they would jam a lot. And if you put these letters in these this location, because they were relatively infrequently used, or at least in particular combinations, they would jam less. So the reason that we have QWERTY keyboards is because it goes back to the original design of typewriters and to keep them from jamming a lot. And why haven't we changed it to something a bit more optimal? Well, no really good reason. It's just, it's, we have a satisfactory solution and it works. I'm sorry, Roger, go ahead. No, no. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking that he, Darwin never, did not coin the term survival of the No, 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 that is. So they were accurate. No, no, you're absolutely right. But and I was gonna say that I often use survival of the fitter than I I like to use survival of the satisfactory. Yeah. You know, the idea of survival of the satisfactory is important because uh, um, there is a tendency that exists today to think that evolution is a process of perfection that is making us better or somehow improving us over time. That's not really what's happening at all. It's a blind process. It doesn't really, 
It doesn't care about anything. And these are all anthropological comments. And it also, this idea that you can improve a species in, in some way is actually, as we've seen historically, is quite dangerous. Uh, the idea that um, you can somehow, through maybe selective breeding or with eugenics, um, uh, 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 you know, produce organisms that are better in some way than others. I mean, one of the things we always have to understand about evolutionary processes is that the fitness of an organism, at least in many respects, can only be un can understood in respect to the particular environment that you find that organism within. You change that environment, what was once a perfectly fit organism become completely unfit. So, anyways, it's, it's, a, it's an idea that 